Hey, welcome back to The Voice of Disruption. I'm Ken Rakowski. I am being joined by somebody I've known for about a decade and a half, and it's Simon Mannering, who originates from Australia. Sydney, Aussie. Australia. Sydney, Australia. That's why I sound funny. You don't sound funny. I think you have that accent that every American aspires to have or really? imitate. I could, I could never understand that. I have no idea why, but I'll take it. I'll take it. So you always start your talk. You, you are a coveted speaker. You have a number one book. Your agency is one of the top in the world. Mm. But you always start, I'm an ad guy. Mm. Why do you start saying that? It almost diminishes what you are. Sure. I mean, what my company does is we build purpose-driven brands, and that's different. But I think the access point for people to understand what you do is something that might be a little bit more familiar. So you say an ad guy, just say, all right, that was the starting point. But what we do now is very, very different. So how do you introduce yourself? So I'm the CEO and founder of a consultancy that builds purpose-driven brands. And what that means is we look at a company, we say, what do you stand for? And then how do you bring that to life inside and outside the company for two reasons? One, you get the talent you want so you can win the talent wars because that's what millennials and Gen Z want. They want to know what you stand for. And two, customers are going to want to buy your products. They'll pay more for your products and they'll talk about you to other people if they know what on earth you stand for. And if you don't do that these days, you're absolutely dead in the water. It has nothing to do with ads then, does it? It doesn't have anything to do with ads. In fact, I think advertising these days has changed more into advocacy and activism. And what I mean by that is, you know, what, what causes do you care about? Or what changes would you like to see there in the world? And it's happening for two reasons. One, typically government and nonprofits would take care of these things. But now consumers are looking at business to do it. And two, so many companies are now talking about what they're doing in the world that you've got to get really, really clear about what you stand for so you cut through the clutter. Otherwise, you're just going to be ignored. You're not going to be relevant. And basically, you're courting disaster for your brand. Simon Mannering's joining us. This is a voice of disruption. Simon, why did you leave Australia to come to the States? Australians, and I don't mean to speak on our behalf or generalize, but you always feel like there's something you're missing out on. You know, you're at the party. Da- you're at the party. Fear you're missing out. out. You're at the party down the street, but you hear the loud and music at the big house at the end. And you're like, mm, mm, mm. and you're like, I want to go there. I want to go to that party. So I did what so many Australians do. I slept my butt all over the world. So I went to Japan and then France and then the UK for a number of years. It's kind of like your rite of passage. And then to the States. And I've been here 15 or 16 years. And um, it's home. I have two American wait, boys. Wait. You got here and we met around the same time? Yeah, I didn't know anybody. Oh, I didn't know that. I did no. not know a single person in L.A. My first dinner in L.A. was at a 7-Eleven with some little triangled <laughs> sandwiches and plastic for my kids. I couldn't even point to the Hollywood sign. I'm like, I'm so turned around. I'm like, yay, family, thanks for coming with me. There's an interesting phenomenon in Australia. It's called the tall poppy syndrome. Absolutely. Can you explain that? Tall poppy syndrome is good and bad. It's a double-edged sword. Basically, it means if you get too successful, then they make cut you down, especially if you're kind of big noting yourself, you're being self-absorbed, you're talking about what you do. So that is a negative in sort of the sense that it disincentivizes you to be an overachiever. It kind of pulls you back down. At the same time, it's good because no one puts up with your BS. If you walk back into Australia anywhere and you sort of kind of think that you're something special, very quickly, it's kind of like this g'day mate thing. You're a mate. It's like you're one of us. We're all good. And so it's a good thing. But doesn't that decrease the incentive to become great? Well, I think it, it's a, it, a double-edged sword. When you go home, it keeps your feet on the ground. But look at all the Australians who over-index and success all around the world. Hollywood and all the other industries out there, we just keep on doing it. Yeah, we but cannot you leave stop. Australia to do it. Yeah, we leave Australia you know, to do the, it. Yeah. The actors that you have from Hugh Jackman, yeah. they had to leave. Yeah. Or, or Rupert Murdoch yeah. had to leave. So to become great, you have to walk out of that environment. I think there's some of us who come into the world and they want to... They want to swim in a bigger pool. They want to kind of match their wits and their talents and their skills against what they perceive to be the best out there. Maybe they're trying to prove something to themselves or maybe they just want to see how far they can go. But do you think maybe that tall poppy syndrome is now in the States? where if you overdo it, you get slapped down. If you're not within these parameters that yep. you're saying, purpose-driven, yep. if you grow outside that and you're a weed, yep. tall poppy. Yeah, and you know what? I, in some cases, I don't think it's bad because some people become so full of themselves, you just got to <laughs> a little bit. But what I noticed, in Australia, there's the tall poppy syndrome. I had four or five years in London working at top ad agencies there, and what I found is they're kind of like, oh, you really want to do that? Oh, mate, it's never going to happen. And they pull you down. It's never going to happen. What I love about the States, and the reason I'm here, is as crazy as it may seem, if you've got some ambition, people go, sure, go for it. Knock yourself out. And then you live or survive on your wits and your skills. And I think for companies today, it's the same. 
The marketplace is nuts. Technology's changed everything. New, younger demos are coming through, looking for different things from you. How do you get the talent you want? How do you keep them? How do you compete in the marketplace? And so I think brands, in the same way, need to be really, really clear about what's unique about them, what their purpose is, not so that they can only talk about it, so that they can tell others about it and they can share it with other people. Otherwise, they're just going to fall flat in the marketplace. I get it. You and I are this, right? We're Gen X? Yeah. I don't know. I'm borderline. You're, I'm, you're, uh, not, you're I, Gen X. I, I, I'm Gen X what, ascending. Or, yeah. What gives you the authority to understand what's going with Gen Y and Gen Z? You know what? That's a good question. There's a lot of data that we can look to. But I think anyone, it's like a parent trying to say that they know their child as well as the child knows themselves. I think there's a qualitative difference. So we can look at all the data all, long, all day long, we can observe their behavior and so on. But when you've actually, you know, eventually you've got to default to the child and say, you know what, let's be collaborative about this. Let's talk about what you'd like in your life, what you'd like to do, what you'd like to see happen, because you can't divine who they are. You've got to kind of honor the fact that they know so the you child best. I have an 18 and a 15 year old yeah, you daughter. Do, you do. I, so live, in, you, I live in a focus group. So, but when you look at these brands that are making these purpose driven challenges and they're actually moving forward, yep. aren't they in some ways overpriced brands? Let me give you an example. Love Starbucks. Go to it on a daily basis, sure. okay? Yeah. It's expensive. Yeah. It's an expensive experience, period. Yeah. They could afford to try this purpose driven yeah. direction. Yeah. Where another brand that maybe is a mom and pop coffee shop, they can't charge that type of money for coffee. They can't go in the same direction yeah, as a Starbucks. Some people might say that companies with more resources can afford to do this, but here's the truth. They're all trying to win over the same customers. If millennials and Gen Z are really looking to you and saying, hey, are you part of the problem or part of the solution? Or if you want to win over a new customer for the first time because you're a mom and pop shop, you've got to give them a reason to align with them, or align with their values. So if you're not clear about what you stand for, you're not going to make that emotional connection. And then you're left with just arguing about price or whatever. And Honestly, these days, and this is timeless, people buy a brand first. If you go to the web and you're considering buying a product, you look at it and you go, which brands am I going to look at? Yes. And then you'll look at the product and the benefits on. Most young companies, if you're a solopreneur, an entrepreneur, they don't have a lot of branding experience. They don't have the resources to do it. Yet they know that they've actually got to be a brand rather than just a marketer of products. And Without that, it's really hard to get the trajectory where everyone out there uses their cell phones and social media to build your business with you. Now, the show's heard and seen around the world. When I say Amazon, we know what that is here in the States. Sure. But in other parts of the world, Amazon's not even there, right. okay? But not Amazon, for long, not for long. Oh, I agree sure. with that, yeah. I agree. But Amazon's done something very unique, and that is they're almost removing the brand and they're wrapping their name around it. Well, they're actually doing some, they're doing that. I mean, Amazon's brand, which was kind of the facilitator for so long, it was sort of subsumed by the products around. They're rising to the top now, partly because of their I mean, number one on the world's richest right. list. And Bezos has played a very sh uh, strategic and wise long game. But what they're also doing, which is interesting, is they're creating a lot of products themselves. So when you search for batteries, the ones that Amazon right. volunteers, Bears. so they're not only controlling the distribution, they're controlling the supply well, as well. We've seen this also in brick and mortar environments. Let's take uh, Costco. They have a Kirkland brand, yep. and they white label everything inside that brand, which does incredibly well. Absolutely. Because we trust the Costco name, yeah. and Kirkland's it. Yeah. Smart move, right? Yeah, it's smart move, but it doesn't come without risk. I mean, you know, you've got to be able to deliver on the quality of product and on the distribution itself. So as much as people sort of envy or point to Jeff Bezos right now, he has built an incredible infrastructure and has invested. If you look at every press release he's ever put out there, he always talks about putting the customer first. Right. Everything and all the recommendation engine and all of that sort of thing, his whole ecosystem is built around you. And I think that's really powerful, and he did it long before a lot of other people are doing it, and he did it more consistently than anyone else. But when I say a brand, and I don't mean to pick and choose, sure. but that's actually bad for you, okay? Right. Like a Pepsi or a Coke. Right. It's not healthy. It's a, a totally recreational type product, and that's it. Sure. But they're going purpose-driven. They're trying to create an environment that makes it safe. Yeah, and there's distinctions here. There, are, there was a time in the marketing world where we controlled media channels. We had television, print, and radio. We told you what was cool, and we told you what to buy, and that was all well and good. And there really wasn't this dialogue backwards and forwards. Social media came along and changed all of that. If you've got a product that's inherently good for you, then you're set up for success, much yep. more than a product which people can argue is, is not great for you. You see companies like PepsiCo diversify into other categories. You see Coke, I think, has a 
176 um, products. Multiple products, right. Yeah, but not many people know that. That's correct. They really, uh, most of their business is focused around um, Coke Red. The consumers will call brands out all day long. If they say they're being purposeful on one hand and they're not delivering something that has a positive benefit on the other, check your social media fields, f f f um, pages. You'll be absolutely called out in a heartbeat. Okay. So if you could look at two brands that excite you on the direction they're going, what would those two brands be? I would say one I'm very excited about right now is Lyft. Lyft? Lyft, wow. because I think that industry was not Lyft, an... by the way, just want to make sure, because yeah. people, again, around the world may not know what Lyft. that is. And they're just going international right now for the first time. They are a competitor to Uber or yep. in other countries like GoJack or Grab. They're a ride-sharing service. They're a ride-sharing service. And what's powerful about Lyft is not only are they a function of the new economy in which crowdsourcing enabled whole new technologies and services to be offered, you know, all these drivers using their own cars to take people where they need to go. You know, five years ago, you'd never tell you your daughter, son or daughter to get in a car with a stranger. But why do you like them? I like them because two reasons. They've been the upstart or the challenger for so long against Uber, which had the first mover advantage and had market dominance. But they've really made a consistent and compelling message around their commitment to the passenger experience, their commitment to causes, their commitment to women. So I just think if you want to inspire your audience to well, build your brand, that's why I like what's them. What's the second one? The second one, I think, is... And this is a mainstay of brands that have been purposeful, but I, I really, really admire them. I'd say Patagonia, only because... You've liked this one for years. I have liked this one for years because not only is the integrity of their intent beyond question, but they're rising to the challenge of polarizing their audience in the sense that they'll say, we stand for this, and if you don't want to, if you don't agree with me, you can buy they somebody challenge. else's product. They challenge them. They, they, they challenge them, and they hold themselves accountable, and when something goes wrong, they hold themselves to a higher standard, and I think they're one of the benchmarks of integrity out there. The company is We First Branding? WeFirstBranding.com is the company, and we've got something very exciting coming up I'd love to share. Well, no. <laughs> okay. There's a reason. I'll tell you yeah. later. I love you so much because yeah. I'm... I'm it's because there's bigger things going on. Fantastic. Yeah. Simon Mannering can be found over at We First, and his book is called We First. Book is called We First. WeFirstBranding.com is the company, and thanks for the opportunity That's to it. share some thinking. So when we come back, we're going to find somebody that uh, might be on that next Forbes list. He's creating a unicorn. What's that? We'll find out more. I'm Ken Rakowski. That's Simon Mannering, and you're listening to Voice of Disruption. We'll be right back.